So good morning, everyone. I can see that our participants are starting to arrive. I'm just going to give everyone another minute before we get going, um, just uh, as people start to trickle in here. Welcome those who've joined us this morning. I popped a question in the chat. Hi there, my name is Emily Gonzalez. I'm coming in from Vancouver today, but I love Guelph. So I was wondering if you could tell me where's your favorite walk in the woods? And maybe it's not in Guelph, maybe it's somewhere else wonderful in the world, but maybe you could put in the chat for me here. What is your favorite place to walk in the woods? All right, well, I think we'll get going. And as people arrive, they can, uh, they can join in. So good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Fazikas, and I'm the research coordinator here at Arboretum. Welcome to everyone to our virtual panel on the UN Decade on Ecological Restoration, hosted by GEAR, the Guelph Institute for Environmental Research, and the Arboretum as well. So this event is part of the Arb Expo, Expo which has a number of events happening this weekend. Some are virtual, such as this panel, and some uh, in-person events are happening later today. So although we are meeting virtually in different places and different spaces, I think each of us has our own personal connection to the land. The land where the Arboretum now grows has been home to plants and animals for thousands of years. It was home to indigenous peoples before settlers arrived. And we recognize the dish with one spoon covenant, the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Between the Lakes Treaty Three lands on which the University of Guelph and the Arboretum now sit. We are honored to work on and to care for this land. For those of you that don't know the Arboretum well, the Arboretum encompasses about 400 acres of plant collections and walking trails and natural woodlands. Um, it's home to more than 2,000 different taxa of woody plants in thematic collections and across our natural areas. And the Arboretum has a mandate that focuses on education, outreach, and research. It hosts many undergraduate courses and acts as a living laboratory to provide support and expertise um, for a wide, wide, a wide variety of, uh, of research projects and workshops that we hold. So the Arboretum was established in 1970. And so we've just marked our 50th anniversary and we think about and look at the old pictures of the Arboretum, in 1970, much of the Arboretum was agricultural fields. So restoration has been an ongoing theme of the Arboretum throughout our history. So just some housekeeping notes. So just uh, so everyone knows this event is being recorded. So in the event that you have some technical issues, you'll be able to watch a recording of it later on. Um, if you do have some technical issues, you can send a message in the chat to uh, the U of G R, uh, and uh, the person handling that will try and help you out with the, the issues that you're having. Um, you'll notice that your video and audio are disabled on your end, which is intentional. Um, if you've got questions as we go along, please put them into the Q&A, which you see the button at the bottom of your screen or into the chat, which uh, many of you have already figured out how to use. So it's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Emily Gonzalez. Emily wears a number of different hats. She is an instructor of conservation biology and restoration ecology at the University of Victoria. She's chair of the Science and Policy Committee of the uh, Society for Ecological Restoration. And probably most importantly, she is a self-professed affectionate alum of the University of Guelph, having completed her master's degree in the zoology department. Um, and spent a lot of time at the Arboretum during her time, her time there. Emily is co-author of a publication titled The UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, 2021 to 2030, What Can Protected Areas Contribute? And she has generously agreed to moderate our panel today and facilitate a discussion. So welcome, Emily. Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you so much for contributing your favorite walks in the woods in the chat. I just loved reading those. Um, so for those who maybe have just joined us, I asked everyone to share something about a special place somewhere among the trees. 
And as you answered, did you imagine yourself in that place? How do you feel when you're in that spot? We need these places more than ever these days. Given the rate of environmental degradation, that means we need ecological restoration. Restoration is a fundamentally hopeful activity, especially in these trying times, and it meaningfully improves the conditions of the world. The process of restoration not only transforms the lands and waters in which we work, it also transforms us and our relationship with nature, our understanding of our place in the world. And so, lucky for us, over the next few minutes, we're gonna to get to hear some stories of those transformations that have been happening globally, nationally, and at local scales. So here's how we'll flow through the next hour. We have three speakers who will share their on the ground experience with restorative activities. At the end of each 12 minute talk, we'll take a couple of questions as we transition to the next speaker. Please post your questions in the chat at the bottom of your screen, sorry, at the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and not in the chat. And the reason for that is because in the Q&A, then your question could be upvoted so that we can get all the questions that folks want to hear to the broadest audience. At the end of the talk, we will unmute your line so you can ask your question in person and to be sure that the speaker understands that question. So let's begin, shall we? And we're going to go big. We're going to start in Pakistan with Reese Khan, who has a master's degree in forestry and until recently was the project director of the 10 Billion Trees Project, 10 Billion Trees. He's worked in government for 30 years, as well as in the United Nations, and has been involved in all phases of emergencies, relief, recovery, rehabilitation, development. So we're so lucky to have this diverse background sharing this incredible story with us today. I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Khan. Yeah, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Uh, uh, this is uh, really uh, uh, quite uh, uh, flattering and uh, honoring that uh, today I have been provided with this uh, opportunity and uh, very good uh, 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 and best uh, uh, good morning for the excellencies, dignitaries and all participants. And uh, my uh, topic is like mostly that what we have carried out in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, the federating unit of uh, Pakistan. And uh, the story start from uh, uh, 2014. That was billion tree uh, forestation project. And it was widely being recognized and uh, the achievement, the crowning and all achievement what we had made on ground was validated by so many agencies. And by having that recognition, ultimately, uh, this uh, billion tree tsunami project was upscaled to 10 billion. So uh, the modalities, uh, the project design, the monitoring mechanism and all those uh, have been like common. So from, uh, if screen is clear, I'll take start from uh, this, uh, presentations. Should I proceed? Yeah, this uh, this billion tree afforestation project was launched in uh, 14, number, uh, 14 November 2014 with the objective to increase the area by 2%. Already we have in KP, uh, 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 total area is 7.45 million. So we were thinking to increase this area to 2%. Uh, rehabilitation of the degraded forest conserve, to conserve KP forest as valuable natural resource for future generation. Establish rules for Red Plus to assign carbon value for skill development and adjust to capacitate our communities and uh, departments. Project was initially designed for four, five years uh, and the total cost was 28 billion. Then uh, it was redesigned for 22 uh, billion. And uh, ultimately, uh, the entire target of uh, uh, 1 billion plants have been achieved in uh, 14 billion before time. This is, and uh, we had uh, the breakup of uh, how to get all those 1 billion trees. Uh, uh, we were uh, thinking the project was conceived that we'll plant the forest department, locals, communities, uh, 200 million plants. And we were thinking that uh, uh, 200 million plants will be distributed free of cost to the communities, to the progressive farmers. And we were thinking that we will make uh, 600 closures 
no for uh, thousand closure and we will get uh, 600 uh, uh, million of sapling to the assisted natural regeneration this phenomena i'll explain uh, in detail uh, the implementation modalities adopted was just uh, uh, awareness campaign was started uh, door to door and uh, electronic media print uh, and then uh, we developed nurseries because uh, this was a big uh, target and we involved the community for private nursery as well and uh, then by having all those plants in start we proceeded for departmental through department staff and uh, all category of plantation we did and uh, we also involved the local communities landowners for the small uh, Block areas we can do brought below uh, 20 uh, hectares. And about 20 hectares, we carried out uh, all those uh, forestation departmentally. And planting to Hashak, this is communal because we were gathering tribes and we provided all those uh, traditional musics and all those uh, eating uh, events. And they were planting and uh, there were uh, dancing. And we call this Hashak because it is our cultural sort of. Uh, event and we just revived all those events as well by having plantation in certain areas and uh, we had outsourced as well the planting to the uh, local contractors uh, this uh, we adopted the implementation modalities just uh, uh, when we have designated forest uh, government land or private forest we involved the local communities to have some uh, ban on grazing and just to extinguish fire in the area. And uh, uh, we were uh, hiring a local watchman, we called in Nigeman, at a cost of rupees uh, 15,000 per month. And all that community was supporting that Nigeman in extinguishing of the fire, collecting of seed, sowing all those seed, and also the free grazing was restricted in that very closures, just to promote or assist nature regeneration. And we provided free distribution, uh, free plants to all uh, like institution, uh, department, uh, armed forces, police, uh, local administration, uh, progressive farmer, or simple, whatever, like the plants were needed, we provided free of cost at the doorstep. And all formation of the department, right from uh, forest guard till to sector, they all were involved. JS technology was uh, utilized for mapping, planning, and measurement of the plantation area. Our implementation was carried out apolitically transparently. Uh, what we adopted awareness, like uh, we used uh, intensive uh, print electronic and social media, uh, public representative and uh, all those symbolic people in the world, ulama, like the religious scholar, education institution, judiciary, art force, administration, civil society were involved. Door to door state campaign were made through as a community development officer, female forest physician, forest staff, because we have uh, an independent director for the social mobilization and social organization. And in each district, we have community development officer and support staff. So we did all those organizations, uh, not only organization, but uh, uh, conveyed the message and philosophy of the project. Uh, we designed a uh, project with side as well, and uh, dignitary media person, environmentalists, all were invited. In were a part of uh, the game. So uh, we raised, uh, this was a very big target as I told. So we uh, involved a local uh, farmer, dude, uh, female, to raise nurseries, both uh, parted and beer rooted. And uh, like uh, this groom, the farmer skills, communication as well as their technological skills. Uh, jobs were provided to them and uh, we they, they were raising plants and we were having with them the agreement, buyback agreement we can call. Uh, we, uh, we had fixed a certain amount that we will uh, raise such like plants. They demanded plant up to their very size and we will buy that uh, at this rate. So we were having an agreement with the farmers at, in advance. So there is nursery as well. 80% plants are for to private nurseries and 13,260 nursery were established by the farmers. And you see, this is farmer nursery, the Kunifar nursery, and uh, the, the, the woman you see uh, in these nurseries. These are also private nursery of deer-rooted plants. 
and we raised uh, departmental nurseries because uh, this was very huge target and uh, we had to raise some uh, good quality and demanded plants. So 20% of plants were supposed to be raised by the department and uh, we raised uh, certain good nurseries at each district for having uh, good and stout uh, planting stock. You see the artwork and uh, this is uh, a departmental nursery. This one is also and you see this and plantation. We had divided certain plantation like uh, black plantation. When we get certain area of uh, uh, above 20 hectare, you will call in those uh, all areas in different ecological zones in saline area and mountain area even in, uh, because uh, this promise, Heber Pakhtunpa promise comprising of so many agroecological zones. So uh, if uh, a farmer having uh, somewhat communal or individual property less than you know, 40 hectare, so uh, up to 20 hectare uh, area, right from one hectare up to 20 hectare was supposed to be uh, covered by woodlots. We had certain uh, provision for those areas to be planted for the progressive farmer or for the general people. So we have also planted in saline and water plot uh, areas. We have planted on the railway, road, canal, and highways. We have uh, stabilized uh, the bad land and uh, the landslides as well. And uh, in certain areas, we have sown and dibbled the seed, the most appropriate seed in different ecological zones. Block plantation uh, mostly raised on communal wasteland, as uh, we were having big chunk, land, uh, chunk uh, blank areas and community were supposed to be involved, and we just carried out. And uh, area more than hectare on each side have been planted. Against the target of 1,59,000 hectare, achievement have been made of 1,59,821 hectare. This has been the block plantation carried out. And you see these people, they are just uh, uh, like uh, working the daily wager employed in uh, a hilly area. And the carriage you see through this uh, pickup, and also in certain area where we have hilly area and the track was like uh, quite sloopy, and uh, we had problem in uh, transporting plants, so we utilize the donkeys and mules to have carriage of plants to that area. Uh, in dry area, we have utilized the uh, water as well for the watering, like it is Chatral, the uh, quite uh, uh, extreme north area adjoining with uh, China. So this was very dry and we utilized the water pond and water and this uh, uh, arid zone and the plantation has been carried out and it has been successful. And this is like uh, the south uh, where uh, we have less uh, rains and uh, it is uh, almost tropical, subtropical and uh, we can say the arid zone. So you see the plantation in uh, those area, D Khan and uh, this uh, Gadi Chand and Peshawar because this is a vast area uh, up to uh, 13,000 uh, hectare has been rehabilitated near Peshawar, our uh, province headquarter. This is uh, this is quite an outskirt of uh, Peshawar. One can easily uh, see the progress of this area. This is uh, Dihan uh, area. This is another correct uh, the south, south Gadi Chandan plantation, as I mentioned, uh, Lucky Marwat area. So this is like uh, how we have carried out the woodlots of one hectare to 20 hectare with the uh, local land owners, uh, small land owners. And this was a healthy competition between the land owners. And payment were made in three installments after we verification that uh, the farmer have raised and have protected the, um, uh, the, the, the area which is uh, being claimed by him. And after all those verification and uh, barriers, we had finally uh, made all those. And uh, about uh, uh, 20,000 hectare have, uh, area have been planted up through the help of those uh, uh, landowners. This is uh, uh, the, the, the progress of those area uh, which have been raised by woodlot. Uh, plantation of uh, in water log in saline area, 20,735 hectare saline water log area is been rejected mostly in South and Vietnam area. This is like uh, you can see the saline water lag area being rehabilitated. This is Gambila, this is riverbed 
and uh, in the south district of Lekki Marwat, the area has been planted in UPC. Plantation on roadside canal and uh, railway track, we call it linear plantation. And it has been carried out uh, because we have the largest canal system. We have the railway track and uh, highway. So for the sake of shared and aesthetic uh, beautification, we have carried out. Uh, and uh, so far, 3,757 hectare area have been planted up canal uh, along with the uh, roads, canal, and railway track. This is like uh, some uh, pictures, shower motorway. Uh, you see the plantation has been carried out. This is Babri Bandi Railway Track to Hart, Chashmar uh, Road Dihan, the plantation along with, and this is also uh, Gamal, Gamalzam Dihan, the area you see, they've been planted. And this is like a very uh, tricky and uh, quite a tricky uh, business we have carried out and the upper reaches in the watershed area where we had landslips, landslides, and uh, we have used both engineering, but mostly, uh, the bioengineering works have been applied and uh, this was really a unique uh, technology. We have learned a lot from it and the uh, most uh, land slip, uh, land uh, slide area have been rehabilitated in the upper reaches of Azara and Malacca and the mountainous area. And we used simple technology. We collected the empty bags of cement. We filled the soil in it and beneath uh, uh, the bags, we put some twigs, uh, branches, and some uh, plants, small plants. And within uh, six months, if you visit that area and see the uh, result, you will not believe it. So this is quite interesting. And by having all those uh, cement bags, we, we have utilized it in judiciously by having uh, rehabilitated so much areas. Like uh, this was in early, uh, now this is uh, our senior staff, secretary and chief conservator, DFO, they are explaining that how we carried out this uh, technique. And now you see the result. And it has been replicated and in many areas and the result is promising and worth seeing every year. We have like uh, this uh, quite uh, uh, good activity as well, sowing and dibbling uh, in uh, area where uh, accessibility has been a problem, we are dispute and where road network were not uh, uh, like available. So sowing and dibbling has been the most uh, easy way uh, and the most economically uh, sound way of rehabilitation and uh, reversing the environmental degradation. This, uh, even in the uh, motorway, Hazara motorway, this has been the sowing, the result you see. Uh, this, this has also been like the outstanding result of Hazara motorway. It was sown, the, the plants you see uh, now on the roadside were like to sowing. This was like uh, the aerial broadcasting have been made in areas from helicopter. Uh, we have distributed uh, uh, 165 million seedling among farmers we are tasked. Uh, raised awareness about the importance of school and income from the farmland. Uh, the wood based industry of uh, uh, province and as well as the Pakistan has been uh, like now with the enhanced supply of fuel wood and the required uh, wood for the composite uh, wood making. Uh, we supplied uh, free of cost to the government institution, armed forces, and NGOs. And uh, now you see this is governor of Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa. This man is planting olive and he is our minister and dignitaries planting. So uh, this was uh, uh, in uh, 2015, our uh, chief minister, Khatakstan, he's planting platinum sodium tail of China. And uh, our minister, uh, Faris, uh, is planting uh, uh, ex-governor and uh, secretary, Tartar Mehta Babasi, they are planting uh, Divdar trees. This was also ex-CM uh, and now in a position, but uh, as uh, I told, like it was a political we had involved all uh, political parties in this very campaign. Religious scholar have been involved in planting. Park Army have been involved in plantation. We are distributing free up uh, cash plants to communities. Yeah, this is like uh, uh, this. There was a study before launching this project that GIG. 
have biblio like they had study our forest and they they revealed that 75% of the forest in kp which uh, which covers 17% to 20% of the entire province and mostly we rely for the wood for the non uh, timber forest product for the uh, aesthetic and also for the energy for the water and all those because these are the watershed area of uh, khyber pakhtunkhwa which serves the entire uh, canal system and uh, our economy is agrarian the plain up to same so this is quite interesting uh, sort of watershed area and uh, if we were shot that 74% of the area uh, which were under forest are under stock so uh, they uh, studied that in usa india and ethiopia they practice that assisted natural regeneration and what we do like uh, we had selected 40 hectare in each uh, area we involved the local community we, we just employed this uh, the, the the local uh, watchman is in egehban and were paying rupees uh, 15000 uh, per month and the, the 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 task was just to bend the free grazing just to collect the seed from the mother trees and so they back in the area and really the the the, the results are promising and uh, uh, about more than 50% out of the uh, billion trees we have achieved from that we re assisted natural regeneration in the uh, natural forest we have uh, we had established 4500 uh, and nine closure over uh, 3 lakh uh, 6009 183 hectare through vdc nation Uh, and the seeding per hectare have been uh, uh, like uh, uh, verified validated by wwf pakistan and are indeed directed and uh, the results are more than 2000 per hectare i'll explain later on. this is some what like uh, the area what have been fenced close from the grazing and fire and you see the regeneration of tree and this is like uh, another uh, the mother tree you see here uh, the conifer and uh, regeneration we need because of this very project in the area has been rehabilitated in the entire province this is another mr khan Hi, yeah this is yeah. Uh, such a big project and uh, i know there's a lot to share i was wondering if you could please just show one more slide and then we'll need to move to the next presenter please okay okay this is this is this is just yeah these are uh, monitoring mechanism because departmental project and all those uh, it has been validated by wwf iucn suparco and uh, uh, like uh, at the international level we have got so many good recognition uh, for the biggest initiative have been uh, taken uh, like uh, this you see uh, the achievement 5 lakh 93 thousand uh, area have been uh, uh, restart rehabilitated for this project and based on this uh, uh, like uh, yeah by having execution of this project 11 uh, people have been martyred six injured and three incapacitated and we had sacrificed the entire holidays for this project for the last 5 6 years and you see the the the, the people who have been martyred or uh, sacrificed their lives in uh, this very project we have some uh, lesson learned political will ownership and all those things you you i have shared this uh, in that very email but like based on uh, the success story what we have uh, like uh, gathered in the khyber pakhtunkhwa the national government has upscaled this project to 10 billion project in now all the six predating unit have been like uh, involved to raise 10 billion tree uh, 10 billion trees in the entire sector predating units in in sin i would say in baluchistan we are working on the coastal forest the mangroves forest and the results were there are uh, promising and so much land have been rehabilitated up to uh, up till now but like uh, uh, this was uh, a very tiny component of 10 billion 27 billion uh, rupees were required to uh, execute to further uh, and raise 1 billion seedling so we are raising 2 billion in khyber pakhtunkhwa and uh, till now uh, like this is the, the 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 project intervention in the area have been uh, rehabilitated uh, uh, 
like 400 uh, million plants have been uh, planted and under a 10 billion uh, project in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. This is like what uh, I had gathered and uh, have shared. Thank you. Nice. Wow, thank you so much. Wow, it's a huge project. There were so many interesting components that I would love to dive into and ask questions. But for now, we're going to move to the next speaker because we're okay. running out of time. Thank you. So you're thank welcome, you. uh, the audience, to put your questions in the chat. And if we have time at the end, we will come back. Um, so let's move to Mike Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, Michael Rosen recently retired as the president of Tree Canada, where he facilitated the Canadian Forest Network, Canadian Urban Forest Strategy, and National Tree Day. He consults on forestry and history and will share his knowledge with us on both of those subjects today. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you, uh, uh, Guelph Institute of Environmental Research in the Arboretum and University of Guelph. Um, I'm really pleased to be here with you today and I'm, I'm ready to share some thoughts with you. Um, can, uh, can everyone see that presentation? Emily? Not you, yet. Yep, yeah, you, can, you can see that okay? Not yet. So, nope, the presentation's not showing yet. Okay, um, okay, hold on. We are able to see your screen now. Thank Great. you. Great, thank you. So can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, Emily? We can hear you great, you bet. Great, okay, so let's get started. Hi, my name is Mike Rosen. I'm gonna to talk to you today about uh, ecosystems and, uh, and restoring them through tree planting. Um, just a few words about myself. So I'm a, I'm a, a forester trained in, uh, at U of T and I also have a, a, a degree in history. I'm a registered professional forester here in uh, in Ontario. And I worked my summers though, interestingly enough, uh, logging camps in British Columbia, but I finished by uh, my degree by working uh, in the city of Ottawa for the National Capital Commission on Dutch Elm disease. So I'm, I have the very, very strong interest in urban forestry. Actually, that's where I've made most of my career has been in, in urban forest. And, and um, so half my career actually has been with Ministry of Natural Resources as a forester, and the other half has been as uh, vice president and president of Tree Canada, a national uh, not-for-profit that plants trees all across uh, all across the country. So bear with me, if you will. I just want to. I just do want to mention a few words about this man, uh, Dr. Eric uh, Jorgensen. He's actually head of the Guelph Arboretum, and he finished his career at the University of Guelph, and he's actually the inventor, the, the grandfather, if you will, of urban forestry in the world, and he's a Canadian. And he's got this strong Guelph connection. He arrived from Denmark in 1959 as a forest pathologist with the federal government. And uh, he went on to found the uh, Shade Tree Research Laboratory for Dutch Elm Disease at the University of Toronto and the Ontario Shade Tree Council, which is now called the uh, Ontario Urban Forest Council in 1964. He finished his career, as I say, at the University of Guelph. And uh, the first uh, the master student in urban forestry in Canadian history was Bill Morrison. That's the fellow shown at the bottom here. This is Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Jorgensen on the left. And he really mentored this first generation of urban foresters. So I just wanted to sort of pay homage, if you will, to Eric Jorgensen, who's got this wonderful connection with the University of Guelph, and he is a real uh, innovator for urban forestry uh, right around the world. The dilemma, if you will, for Canada is that we are, in Europe, they, they really uh, ventured around the idea of controlling human nature, but in North America, we really wanted to tame wilderness. That was sort of the theme of a lot of our 
uh, a lot of our uh, uh, colonization, if you will, of this country. And, um, uh, you know, the irony is that uh, Canada has 417 million hectares of forest. We have 10% of the world's forest. We lead in the world in the amount of timber productive land and the area burnt by fire, a whole bunch of statistics around forestry, yet over 83% of Canadians are actually urban, 20% of which are foreign born. So for many people, trees are not so much a resource, if you will, but really an entity to preserve in their lives. And I have four pictures here. University of, this is the Arboretum top left. Top right is actually uh, city of Winnipeg. Uh, bottom right is uh, Quebec City. And of course, our friends uh, close by the uh, city of Toronto on the bottom left. So trees are a, are a huge influence in people's lives as we become quite an urban society. I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, mostly afforestation. I just wanted to distinguish reforestation, which is the replacement of forests, if you will, from maybe older forests to younger forests. You see this in the top photo, as opposed to what I would call afforestation, which is really a land use change going from either farm farmland to forest or even urban uh, areas to forest and so that most of the the what I'll be talking about is in the afforestation realm the land use change going from sort of one land use to another true deforestation in Canada is really uh, not that big it's uh, really less than one percent of forest land is really converted to other uses between the years 1990 and 2018 this gives you a sort of a diagram of what real deforestation looks like. Deforestation is, of course, the change of land use from forest to something else in Canada. And you can see the leading pieces of deforestation in Canada is, is mostly hydroelectric production and a little bit around what we call built up, which is urbanization and, and the mining industry as well. Forestry plays a relatively small role. Agriculture is a declining role as well. So when we talk about tree planting for ecosystem restoration, we're talking about a process by which we're, we're, we're bypassing, if you will, natural regeneration because all land in Canada, if it's cleared, will pretty well regenerate into trees at some point. But the question is, do we want to really wait that long? So it's, it's more of a case of speeding up the succession process and controlling the composition of species, what type of tree we will actually have. That's part of the re reason why we wanna do tree planting. And how we do it is, is there's, there's a few steps. It's not really simple. I'm making it sound really simplistic, but of course there's some nuances to all this. And we've heard that a lot of those nuances in our last presentation, which is pretty amazing around what they're doing in, in Pakistan. But here we, we're looking at uh, effective site preparation, usually for, for planting picking the right tree for the right site. In other words, making sure that we use uh, native tree species, that they, are, uh, that they are adapted, if you will, to the site. Is it sandy? Is it clay? Is it wet? Is it dry? Is it in the shade? Is it in the full sun? All those things matter. Using, utilizing best nursery practices, getting the best nursery stock we can, making sure it's transferred to the site in a way that the trees are gonna live a long time planting practices, making sure the plants are planted at the right depth. When things are planted, we always have to think about maintenance, meaning the clearing of weeds, if you will, around trees to ensure that they live. There's an actual allelopathic relationship between old field and trees. Trees and, and old, there's not many trees that can live in what we would call an old field situation. And uh, that we want to uh, promote the trees. We have to deal with the, um, the competition provided by weeds uh, uh, around the trees. And finally, we're looking at protection. In this bottom picture, you can see the use of tubex to protect trees from mostly deer predation, if you will. Now, certain species, of course, do better than others in the planting scenario. Uh, we're looking at a red pine at the top which is very well adapted to growing in an old field situation. And then the bottom is a bur oak, not so much. We have a lot of trouble actually growing hardwoods or deciduous trees in an open field afforestation uh, condition, basically because 
hardwoods or deciduous trees in, and I'm talking more in the Southern Ontario uh, area, are really adapted towards growing in their own shade. They're, they're really not well adapted to being outplanted in the middle of a field. And that's part of the reason why we see the, the preference or the proliferance of conifers in a lot of our afforestation projects is because they'll do quite well in the open field condition. I've actually written uh, articles around the concerns that have been expressed around, you know, pine plantations that have been created. And my, my, um, my argument is that given good management and time, a lot of these plantations will in fact become quite diverse as they allow natural regeneration to come in. So there's all kinds of diversity issues expressed around plantations. Why are they all the same species, etc.? My contention is that in the long term, these plantations will eventually be uh, overrun, if you will, by uh, natural regeneration, hardwood regeneration, which will come in under the canopy of the uh, of the plantations, provided that they're properly uh, thinned and and managed, if you will. I think this all fits in well with the decade of ecosystem restoration that we see. Um, you know, the, there's 10 goals around this that the UN has provided in this decade coming up of ecosystem restoration, including the idea of conserving biodiversity and countering the effects of climate change, engaging, broad engagement. I know at Tree Canada, where I worked for quite a number of years, I was president of Tree Canada, we always made sure that a lot of our planting crews were uh, indigenous crews. We also used a lot of people uh, in, this, in our urban plantings, what I would call underserved uh, communities to do our, our plantings as well. Of course, there's a high level of a recovery. These are all points expressed by the UN uh, with the, uh, the way that our, um, our regeneration, our restoration was done using native species and using natural succession as well. A lot of these conifer uh, plantation type forests also provide a lot more interior forests. They will actually let species of animals that require interior forests live uh, in those, it extends the interior of those forests. Measurable goals is very important. At Tree Canada, we wanted to see 60% survival at year five, or we would do what we would call refill planting to, uh, to fill in areas that were lost. Um, evaluating the plantation at one, two, and five years is very important to figure out whether we need to, again, refill plant, even change species sometimes when they don't work. And all this integrates well with certain uh, new initiatives, the Two Billion Tree Initiative of the federal government. And also in Quebec, there's quite an effort around uh, climate change and increasing the efforts to uh, essentially plant abandoned farmland back into uh, productive forests. Just a few words about a Tree Canada that I worked with for a number of years. It was founded in 92. It's about the only national profit that's dedicated to planting trees in the rural and urban environments. And there's a number of programs that are used to help restore tree cover in areas hit by natural disasters and hurricanes and that sort of thing. 83 million trees planted by Tree Canada. Quick plug for National Tree Day, which is the Wednesday of National Forest Week, September 22nd this year. Try to celebrate it if you can. Um, it has a board of directors, uh, an Ottawa staff of 18, and a system of national community advisors of 16. But what's really interesting about Tree Canada is that it's totally supported by the private sector. And so you see these big national companies who are trying to actually do something good for the environment. And tree planting, of course, and forest restoration is one of the simplest things that they can do. So as David Nowak of the United States Department of Agriculture said, urbanization, urban forests are likely to be the greatest forest influences and influential forests of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Wow, fantastic, Mike. Again, because we're running a little short on time, we'll just transition to the next speaker. And while that's happening, I just want to acknowledge the ambitious scale of both of these presentations we've seen, as well as the importance of community engagement really comes through in both presentations. So we hope to come back with some questions at the end, but right now I'd really love to introduce Ian Murphy. 
a recent graduate <laughs> from the University of Guelph and is currently at the Arboretum. Today, he'll tell us about his capstone project, which was analyzing a 40-year-old gravel pit restoration project in the Arboretum grounds. Please take it away, Ian. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for having me today. Um, it's really exciting to, to be here and talking with everyone. Um, so yes, today I'll be talking about my work with one of the Arboretum's in-house restoration projects. Um, and I'd like to start off by again, thanking you all for being here. Um, so as you mentioned, um, I am a recent graduate and as part of my internship course and a capstone experience, I became involved with the Gravel Pit Rehabilitation Project. Um, so right here, you can see, um, unlike the previous speakers, as you uh, mentioned, the scale of this restoration project is it's much more local um, and it's contained within the borders of the Arboretum itself. However, we hope that its impacts will be much larger spread. So here we have a short little video of uh, a tour of locations. So beginning with the bird's eye view of um, the city of Guelph um, and then zooming into the Arboretum and then finally ending with the site of the re rehabilitated gravel pit, which has been the focus of the research over the past year. So if you can see that there, as long as the video went through, um, in the middle of uh, in the middle of these roads here are uh, is the gravel pit, and then the largest road in the back is Victoria Woods or Victoria Road. Sorry. Okay, so um, the gravel pit rehabilitation project is just one of the Arboretum's unique collections, and has represented a living laboratory that my fellow biodiversity classmates and I were lucky enough to explore through a scientific lens this past spring and summer. This one hectare actively naturalized gravel pit is located in the Arboretum along Victoria Road, adjacent to the old growth of Victoria Woods and the new Godling Wildlife Gardens. The site was included in the original land purchased by the university with the intention of turning the worked out pit into a display collection of trees, shrubs, vines, a potential use for various disturbed soils in Canada, but especially suited for pit and quarry sites. In essence, this is creating a living laboratory, a living demonstration of plants that can withstand severe conditions of aggregate. In doing so, hazards and environmental impacts of pits and quarries such as erosion, air and water pollution and disturbed habitats can be reduced while turning the ecosystem to a functioning state. Over a three year period beginning in 1977, eight, 86 woody plant species were introduced to the site. Species were selected for purposes such as agriculture, forestry, recreation and wildlife habitat. A variety of planting techniques and amendments were used in the experimental site, such as the different propagation techniques like direct seeding of trees and shrubs or rooted and unrooting cuttings, as well as different mulching and weeding treatments. In the end, four distinct regions were shaped from the original pit, each with its own group of plants and planting techniques, highlighting different goals. So in region one, there was woody ground covers, region two, spring shrubs and trees, region three, wildlife shrubs, and region four, herbaceous ground covers. So this image is a photo taken by Sarah Lowe, the research coordinator at the time, showing the site of the gravel pit prior to rehabilitation. In the photo, bare aggregate is exposed, emphasizing difficult conditions for plants to grow and to colonize the site. This next photo is a drone shot of the gravel pit in the summer of 2021, over 40 years after the gravel pit rehabilitation. There is a stark difference between these two images and the degree of vegetation which is present. And it's clear that some major changes have occurred over this time frame, with, which merits further research. But what exactly is it that I'm doing now and why? So this year marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Art Freedom and the University of Guelph, or sorry, just the Arboretum, <laughs> while also being part of the UN's Decade on Ecological Restoration. Therefore, the Arboretum has decided to revisit some of its older plant collections, such as the Gravel Pit Rehabilitation Project, that represent in-house restoration projects. Several questions guide the reopening of this project. One, what are the major changes that have occurred over the last 40 years as the site is naturalized? What planting survived, what didn't, and why? Two, what can we do to improve the site for the benefit of biodiversity and environment? And three, what important findings can we take away and apply to other similar locations that are scattered across the landscape? In order to begin answering some of these questions, I had to first understand the state of the ecosystem at the time it was left naturalized. To do this, I delved into archival materials of the project, scanning countless original records and summarizing them in more accessible formats. Another key goal of my work was to create an updated planning map and list for the site. I could easily map the plantings to maintain spatial relationships and establish a new baseline collection system by integrating my knowledge of GIS and some of the Arboretum's new technologies such as the GPS tablet. So by digitizing this planting map, it allows me to locate original plantings on the ground without the aid of outdated maps. Outdated maps. 
So this allowed me to create diff direct comparisons between the various years and measure attributes such as growth and mortality across the pit. By using the G GIS with a tablet, I could assess the state and presence or absence of different plantings in the pit. On top of survival data, data diameter of breast height was taken for each tree, and the Eman tree monitoring protocols were used to record tree health and crown class. In the end, I was left with data on roughly 1,350 unique plants and was able to generate a new baseline planting map that can be seen on the right. Notice that many original plantings have now been obscured or limited by the many new colonizers of the site. An additional biosurvey was done using a quadrant analysis in the pit where 50 2 by 2 meter plots were randomly laid out over the gravel pit with locations identified using the GIS. The sampling effort recorded both herbaceous and woody species across the site and was largely performed by biodiversity intern Kaylee and Casey. These interns are also participating in the biodiversity capstone course that will continue to address questions about the site. They're seen in the image on the left. So results. The bio inventory completed between May and July 2021 found many mature trees and shrubs as original planting, plus many more established through natural colonization. 200 trees and shrubs from the original planting were identified, comprising 36 of the original 86 species planted. Some of the large trees still found on the site are Manitoba maple, silver maple, Siberian elm, eastern white cedar, black locust, and several populous species. Native trees of significance not included in the original planting, but now found on site are white elm, green ash, and the common hop tree. Native trees, however, are outnumbered by invasive trees and shrubs that colonize the site or were used in the original planting, such as common buckthorn, Remnus cathartica, uh, glossy buckthorn, and a variety of honey locust species. However, there's large evidence of habitat utilization by a very variety of migratory and non-migratory bird species, small mammals, insects, and amphibians, such as this common leopard frog seen on the right. So this image depicts a fallen uh, poplar tree um, and indicates the harsh growing conditions currently in gravel pit. As you can see, the roots grow through pure rock and sand, and this is 40 years after the original rehabilitation. So although there's a thin layer of soil, which represents the success in itself, um, the few inches that managed to build up over the last 40 years highlights the speed at which these processes occur, and then therefore the importance of maintaining our soil resources so we don't have to continue this large process in the future. So in conclusion, moving forward with the project, we aim to produce a more specific analysis on what species survived, what didn't, and hopefully identify some general trends relating to planting method, amendments, mortality, and the history of invasions by non-native species. To highlight the importance of this work, all you have to do is look at it from a bird's eye view at the city of Guelph, and you can quickly identify a large quarry site, the Guelph Dolan Quarry. This site is roughly the size of the entire downtown footprint and is currently in the process of being purchased by the city to initiate the rehabilitation project. By identifying factors such as those mentioned above, we can manage this unique collection in a way that best supports people and biodiversity, as well as apply these lessons both locally and globally to help heal a landscape scarred by extractive industries in this decade of ecological restoration. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Um, for more information, please reach out to me with the email below. Um, and additionally, there's potential for overflow gravel pit tours today around 1 p.m. in case anyone would like to see the site in person. Thanks again. Thank you, Ian. I would love to sign up for that tour. <laughs> if only I could get across the country <laughs> in time. Um, and thank you for being on time with your talk. That allows us to have some time for questions as well. So folks in the audience, please go ahead and put your questions or comments down in the question and answer box at the bottom for any of the three speakers. Please feel free to upvote any of the questions that are there. And um, yeah, the floor is open. It might be helpful to specify which speaker you might be asking your question for. So I'll give you a moment to uh, pop that into the Q&A. I did notice while that's uh, happening, did notice that there was a question, Mike, around afforestation and the definition that you were using. So Melissa asked, I thought afforestation was defined in the Kyoto Protocol as land not forested since 1990. Could you come off mute and just speak to your definition of afforestation in this case? Sure, no problem. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, no problem. That, that's a good question. Uh, 1990 was the was I under Kyoto Protocol was established as a baseline year 
by which measurements of of offsetting would be uh, would be measured by, but I don't. I'm not aware of it as of being um, as part of the definition of what afforestation is. So in my mind, afforestation, uh, if we if we actually look up the the, def, the definition, it's a it's a specific um, afforestation is a is the is the change of land use from one to uh, from one use to a forested use. That's how I under, I understood the uh, afforestation definition. Okay. Excellent. So I see another question here. Uh, thank you, Ian. What would you say was the biggest surprise you came across while inventorying the site? Any particular species, discoveries, or landscape observations that stood out? And this is a question from Sean Fox. Hi, thanks, Sean, for the question. Um, I'd have to say the most uh, kind of amazing thing that I found was just that diversity in, uh, in the size of some trees that I would find. Um, I didn't get a chance to mention this in my presentation, but um, a lot of the trees that I found and could link to original records had little tree identifying tags on them that you know the accession numbers. Um, some had lost these tags over the 40 years that they were in there. And so it's a very interesting time trying to gauge which ones were from the original planting, which were not. You could have trees that would be, I don't know, 12 inches in, uh, in diameter. Um, that were from the same time, as well as trees that were that size and diameter. So it's just amazing how the different um, impacts of like, natural history, um, potential like insects and other pests can influence the size and growth of trees over that amount of time. Super, thank you. Uh, maybe we'll be able to squeeze in one more question. So, Melissa, I see you have a question for Reese Khan. Um, I think maybe it'd be easier if we took you off mute so that you could ask your question directly to the speaker. Would that be okay? <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. So, go ahead. Is Melissa off mute? Can she ask your question? Can you hear me? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, um, Reese, I was just, I was most interested perhaps for, for time now, I mean, in India with your programs, um, how did you sort of work in your under planting or, or, or the challenge of, of policymakers just using uh, forest hectares planted, new forest hectares planted as the only measure of success? How do you, how do you convince policymakers to talk about uh, improving the biodiversity of a site that has sparse tree cover on it, but could be improved. So your, your one slide noted 74% of forests were understocked in your inventory. So what would you do about that? Yeah, like uh, uh, before, uh, because we had no political sort of support from the national government. And uh, uh, since uh, uh, decades, we were utilizing our natural forests for the wood and all those uh, few load and uh, really, uh, the area were uh, getting uh, pressure and uh, the degradation you see that uh, at the nation. So by having all those uh, report and fortunately we got uh, the new regime and they realized the problem. And also we had certain floodings in 2010, we got very uh, unprecedented floods in 1992, we got uh, the flood. So by realizing the degraded forest, the nation degraded forest, which uh, were supposed to like uh, preserve uh, our watershed in those catchment area, when we realized the government uh, automatically like uh, accepted uh, the suggestion what we gave like just to uh, improve the uh, natural regeneration in all those areas to ban cutting, uh, whether it is commercial or for domestic uses and just to uh, resow the area through the local communities and we have not included that very area uh, in our uh, area what uh, we claim like uh, the, uh, the, the the 2% what we claim or 6% now we claim in uh, Hebert of Kulpa. This what we claim is outside of the designated forest what we have planted. This is 0.28 million uh, uh, area have been hectare have been planted and uh, like uh, 0.18 million hectare have been rehabilitated. Now it has been like on the government agenda that uh, the other forest in Balochistan as well as in Sindh and Punjab 
they are supposed like the naturally existing patches are supposed to be rehabilitated the way it has been rehabilitated by the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Like in Punjab, the same model has been captured, the same Chowkidar, the same community mobilization. And the results for the last three years, that is quite promising. And now, like it has been realized at the uh, national level, at the uh, Ministry of Climate Change, and everybody appreciates and everybody uh, like now has realized the problem what we see. Like we are the sixth uh, most vulnerable country uh, because of the, uh, the less rains and the floods and all those we have seen. And now everybody right from uh, top to from, from prime minister up to the layman, now everybody is involved in green the country and uh, percentage, though we have good percentage, 20% in favor of Kumpa, but as a whole in country, we have 5% uh, forest cover. And we hope say that it will be increased to uh, 12% as a whole and uh, 25 to 30% in favor of Kumpa. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll just take one more question, uh, and this one's for you, Mike. Here in Guelph, we have an ambitious canopy target. Could you point to some of the best ways at the city level to increase canopy from Jay Richardson? Okay, great. Well, that's, a, that's quite a question. That's a great question. Um, yes, Guelph is known for uh, uh, good canopy cover. You know, canopy cover, it's a... It's a it's a it's an easy measure of how an urban forest is actually doing. There's it's not a 100% uh, uh, true and tried system, but um, um, obviously the it has to start with a plan and a good inventory. So I would say that would be the first steps. I I'm assuming that Guelph has that already, but usually what happens is that um, an analysis is done of the canopy, and you're able to see sort of uh, obviously where the gaps are uh, within the community and what has to be worked on on a percentage basis. These days, a lot of communities are going with a 40% canopy target, uh, canopy cover target, which I, which is sort of a good one for Southern Ontario. It doesn't work so well in the prairie sort of thing, but it's good for Southern Ontario. I would say, you know, the, the tactics to increase canopy cover have to do with actually uh, gets into the political realm because, um, of course, preserving existing canopy is actually a lot easier than creating new canopy with new forests. So probably uh, this is where we get into the realm of tree bylaws and um, uh, maintaining trees as much as we can on, believe it or not, private land. People don't realize it, but 60 to 70 percent of the urban forest is actually privately uh, owned. Uh, people always look at that strip on the street and figure that that's the, uh, that's the urban forest, but really the urban forest is in backyards and shopping malls and all kinds of uh, institutional places as well. So I think it starts with good bylaws and it goes into, of course, um, where planting occurs, uh, good planting practices using uh, uh, tried and native species good nursery stock, um, uh, making sure during construction projects, for instance, that trees are protected, municipal and private trees during construction to ensure that they're, they're protected as we go along. Um, those are all techniques used to increase canopy cover, but the, the, the important ones are to preserve actually what you have and to look at the gaps in your, uh, in your uh, urban forest and to, and to fill those gaps. Like I said, because you're dealing with private land, a lot of it is stewardship oriented, convincing private people, people who own uh, private land, who own those trees to um, maintain them in a way that they're gonna, their canopies gonna continue to grow and to promote. Um, uh, many municipalities have tree giveaways or subsidized prices on trees and those are good things to have as well. Thanks. Thank you, Mike, and I really appreciate that perspective shift. Even though we're really focused on rehabilitation and restorative activities in today's three talks, that ultimately protection of what we do have is really the first place to start when we can. For sure. So thank you for that. All right, I'd like to bring it full circle here and we'll end today's session with research coordinator of the Arboretum, Dr. Aaron Fazakis. 
Thanks, Emily. I just want to, to add my thanks to, to yourself and to the panelists on behalf of uh, the Guelph Institute for Environmental Research and on behalf of the Arboretum. That was a, a three great presentations and a, and a great discussion um, afterwards. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Arboretum Expo continues today with a number of events. There's uh, a panel at 11 o'clock, How to Draw a Tree, which I'm going to try and pop down for myself. So hopefully I'll see some of you there. Um, and then there's not a number of different walks that are happening uh, starting at one o'clock. So maybe, um, I don't know if Jenny, if you could, there's the link in the chat. So if you follow that link, you can see all the different events that are happening. So with that, um, we'll close and just uh, thank you once again for all the participants today. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye, Dr.